So our next uh, speaker is Michael Banks, <coughs> news editor of the Physics World magazine, which many of us read with great interest uh, every time. Um, he started with a PhD in solid state physics um, at the MPI, MPI for solid state research in Stuttgart. And um, he's uh, involved with, with uh, covering development of physics facilities around the world. So he's very well qualified to speak to us today. And it's amazing what you can pick up from the web. I found, from Michael, from your website that you're recently become experienced in changing nappies. <laughs> well, we could, we could exchange. I've done that twice in my, my first my children, then my grandchildren. And there's been evolution in the technology over that period. So we could, we could chat about that. That's not the subject of this talk. Well, thank you for the introduction. I wasn't quite expecting that, uh, that part about the nappies. But um, right, so I've been tasked with um, talking to you about what's kind of coming up in the next decade, what we can look forward to in terms of the some of the big science facilities that are going to be built and come online in the next decade. Um, but before that, I'll kind of touch on what we kind of mean by big science, give you some examples of some recent results um, that have resulted from big science facilities, and then I'll give you kind of my top 10 uh, facilities that are coming up in the coming decade. So, I think I can use that. Um, so, first of all, a little bit of a plug. Um, so, I work for Physics World magazine, um, some of our covers there. Um, and this is the Institute of Physics magazine. It's published um, each month. And I'm the news editor of that magazine, and we have a website as well, physicsworld.com. So, I guess I'm, I'm coming from this a slightly kind of independent. I'm not an academic, I'm a journalist. Um, so, I'll kind of give you a bit of an independent look um, you know, I'm not affiliated to any of these uh, facilities that I'm going to talk about. So that might give you some kind of a bit of a different or interesting insight to that. So what do we mean by the traditional model of big science? Um, well, if we went back to the kind of 40s, 50s, 60s, um, a lot of these initiatives were, you know, kind of involved thousands of scientists, um, costing billions of dollars in terms of um, you know, if you convert that to, to today's money. Um, some example of, examples of which are the Apollo program and the Manhattan Project. Um, and what these really were about was these were kind of like national, national programs that had a kind of a very strong military or national tr strategy objective. Um, and then around the same time, um, around the 50s and 60s, you kind of had this different um, kind of model come along. Um, and this was kind of more termed research infrastructure. So these kind of, at the time, tended to be national funded facilities. So one example of which is Fermilab in the United States, um, and then closer to home here, uh, the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. And, as, and as, as well as those kind of national facilities, you also had kind of some international centers that emerged. One example of which is CERN, which we've had a, a talk about today. Um, you know, CERN evolved as a result of after the Second World War in terms of bringing countries together in, t in terms of like a research collaboration. Um, and again, you know, the kind of a common, a common theme that, you know, that they still involve, you know, hundreds to thousands of scientists. Um, some have budgets uh, approaching, a, you know, a billion euros. But there's one kind of key difference, um, and it kind of, it's made eloquently here by Robert Wilson, who was the first uh, director of Fermilab. Um, he was giving US Congress testimony, where he was asked by a congressman um, what kind of applications or military applications this Fermilab uh, accelerator facility had. And he came out with this, this classic line, um, you know, it has nothing to do directly with defending the country except to make it worth defending, which is a, a great quote. So, in terms of big science infrastructure in physics, so many of them kind of today tend to be dominated by certainly in terms of like particle physics, nuclear physics. Um, and this is mostly because you kind, of, you, know, you kind of want to go to higher energies and you kind of want a higher luminosity. That's a, a term for the rate of collisions per second. And then also you want a bigger detection volume, you're looking for kind of more rare events. Um, so you kind of, you know, kind of, you're kind of in maximizing everything. And that's to some extent it's the same in, in astronomy, in that, in that you want larger collection, collecting areas, um, and also as a, as a result of that, you kind of get an increased or better resolution to detect fainter objects. 
And then other fields, um, you know, I've talked a bit about particle and nuclear and astronomy, but there are, there are other fields also that have kind of, you know, big, what we kind of big research infrastructures. Um, for example, um, there's synchrotrons, uh, neutron facilities. Um, these t t tend to be like complementary techniques. So, you know, researchers might do the little science, if I can term it that, little science um, experiments in the lab. And then they use these then facilities like new, neutron facilities and synchrotrons to then do complementary work uh, to what they're doing in their own labs. So some examples then, um, you know, what, what are some of the, the big questions that, uh, that are being answered or you know, big, some of the big questions in physics that are being answered by these facilities? Well, there really are, you know, fundamental questions, you know, what the universe is made of, why does matter dominate over antimatter in the universe? You know, when the universe was created in the Big Bang, there was equal amounts of matter and antimatter, but somehow matter has come to dominate, and you know, what, why is that? Um, and then also, the, you know, is there more particles beyond what we, what, what we know uh, to be the standard model of particle physics? So some recent examples then. Um, you know, Isabella's already touched on this one. Now, I'm not going to describe it too much. Um, but the discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012 at the Large Hadron Collider. So the Large Hadron Collider, that's a 27 kilometer long particle collider, which, you know, huge, as Bill has showed, huge cathedral sized detectors. Um, and they were searching for the Higgs boson, which they, they discovered um, in 2012. And that resulted in a Nobel Prize a year later in uh, 2013. Another one that was the 20, 2013 itself, that was the um, <coughs> discovery of high energy cosmic neutrinos, and um, that was at Ice Cube, and um, that's based at the South Pole, um, the South Pole Station, which is pictured here. Ice Cube actually is around 86, um, 2.5 kilometer long like, strings of detectors that are basically in the ice itself. It's one of the biggest neutrino observatories. I think it is actually the biggest neutrino observatory in the world. Um, but they detected very high neutrinos um, in 20, uh, 2013, and we're at around 30 TeV, but some of the origin of which we we're not, still don't quite understand. Then a bit closer, Tom, so in 2016, uh, there was the discovery of gravitational waves. That was at the um, laser interferometer gravitational wave observatory. The twin detectors, uh, one is in Hanford and one in, in Louisiana. Uh, they're for, they, they're basically, the principle of these is two four-kilometer no, okay. uh, four long arms that act as an interferometer, so you send laser beams down each path, they get recombined, and then any slight minute change you know, could be as a result of a gravitational wave. Uh, and, they, and in 2016, they detected um, gravitational waves uh, for the first time, so that really opened up a new window on the, uh, on the cosmos. And then finally, so this is my final example. Um, so last year, I'm sure you may well be aware that the first ever image of a black hole that was released uh, by the Event Horizon Telescope um, last year, and this is a, uh, it's content, the Event Horizon Telescope contains around eight telescopes. And the clever thing about that is it kind of, re it can combine it combines all the detections from each telescope and so kind of like cleverly computes them together into this kind of one image. Um, so if you wanted to take an image of a black hole, you would need a telescope that, if, you, if it was a single dish telescope, it would need to be the actual size of the Earth itself, which is clearly impractical. Um, you're not going to have that anytime soon. Um, but the clever technique that astronomers use is to combine signals in a clever way um, to then give you that same effect of having a telescope similar in size to the Earth. Um, there's a good analogy for how you, for detecting a black hole, and that's, it's the same as spotting an orange on the moon. So that gives you kind of a sense of, you know, how difficult it is, it was, to, um, to kind of see that black hole at the centre of um, Messier 87. Right, so there were some examples of some of the big, big the results out of big science facilities that we've seen in the, in the previous, in the past decade. Um, so now I'll just I'll go through some facilities to watch in the future. So I'll go through some that are based in um, astronomy, particle nuclear physics, 
and then some other fields such as fusion um, and laser physics. So first off is the James Webb Space Telescope. So uh, that's set to launch next year, though I understand that might not be the case. It might be delayed somewhat. Um, there's a recent US government accountability office report which said there's about a 12% chance of it being launched in 2021. So it looks like it's possibly going to be delayed again. Um, this was originally set, I think, to launch in 2012, around that time. But it's almost been a decade now of delays. Um, so what this consists of is a 6.5 metre diameter mirror um, made of 18 six segments. And this, this is a space-based telescope, so it'll be put at a specific point called the L2 point in space. Where it can kind of like usefully, it's one of the gravitational balance points where it can usefully kind of hover without too much interference from, from the Earth. Um, the cost is quite large, it's 8.8 .8 billion, um, and it'll kind of be, one of its main aims will be you know, detecting ancient, um, very distant galaxies. Um, but this, this, when, when it does finally launch, you know, it will be a really a new window on the universe um, again, um, succeeding the Hubble Space Telescope, which was launched in 1990. Still in astronomy, so um, the European Extremely Large Telescope. So that's a telescope with around a 39 metre diameter primary mirror that's being built in Chile at the moment. It's currently being built. This, that's an artist's impression. Um, that's expected to come online in 2025. Um, again, that's of the order of about around a billion. And some of the things that we'll be doing is looking at the... Um, looking at kind of the atmospheres at planets outside of our own solar system, so exoplanet research, um, and also the evolution of, of galaxies as well. Oops. I think I pressed it. Oh, okay. And then I'm not going... Oh, oops. No, going too far. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about SCAR. To be <laughs> that's already been covered well in the, uh, in the previous talk. Um, and again, that's kind of a costing around about a billion, a billion dollars. Um, set to come online 2028. Um, being, being built in, in Southern Africa and, and Australia. So then switching over to um, particle physics. Um, so one of the big facilities that's going to come online um, in the next decade will be the Long Baseline uh, Neutrino Facility. That's being built in the US. So that involves two, component, two parts to that one. So the one if I mentioned Fermilab before, the particle accelerator. Um, they basically fire protons at a target that produce a intense beam of neutrinos that then fly across all the way to uh, Sanford, the Sanford Underground Research Facility, which then holds this huge um, liquid argon detector. This is actually a, a, the, what, the, what the gentleman that is standing in is actually a prototype. Um, that's, be, that's just been built at CERN. Um, but the actual, the actual facility itself will, is, will consist of around that's but times about three or four uh, in terms of size. So it'll be a really huge, um, huge detector being built at Sanford. Um, again, that's of the order of a billion, 1.5 billion. And one, one of the key aspects that we'll try to solve is um, whether there's a, any kind of symmetry violation in neutrinos, that's charge parity violation, um, which, could give, which could give an indication of um, you know, why that question I asked before that why there is more matter than um, antimatter in the universe. So as well as this facility that's being built in the US, um, there's actually a, a competing facility um, that's being built in Japan. Um, that just actually received the go-ahead from the Japanese government uh, last month, actually. Uh, so the first funding for that has come through. So that's been, that's construction of that now is beginning. Um, so the name of this one's called Hyper Kamiokande. Uh, that's in Kamioka in northern Japan. And um, instead of argon, as the, uh, uh, the long baseline neutron facility uses, this, will, this uses ultra-pure water to detect neutrinos that are fired from... Um, they're, they're being sent from a particle, particle accelerator in the Tohoku region, um, at the J-Park facility. Um, and this basically will consist of this huge tank um, containing about 260,000 tonnes of ultra-pure water. Uh, the tank itself is around 75 metres in diameter, 60 metres tall. Um, 
and that was set to come online. So it's set to come online around the same time as the LBNF. So basically, these two facilities are going to be uh, racing with each other to um, to discover the uh, symmetry, if there is any symmetry violation in, in uh, CP violation in neutrinos, coming in a little, slightly under a billion dollars. Right. So that's a um, little bit about neutrino physics, but of course, you know, there's more to particle physics than that. Um, as you know, at the moment, there's the CERN Large Hadron Collider. That's, been, that's um, at, the, at the CERN laboratory. Um, and there's a big question now about what comes next after, after CERN. After, sorry, not after CERN itself. Um, after the LHC. Um, and one, one quite mature design is the International Linear Collider. So this is a 20-kilometer-long uh, linear accelerator. Um, it accelerates electrons and positrons and smashes them together. Uh, and the reason for this is to carry out precision studies of the, um, of the Higgs boson. So proton-proton collisions are quite messy. There's a lot of debris. And, um, and if you really want to do very precise measurements of some of these um, decays that the, that the Higgs goes into, then you really need an electron-positron machine. So this machine, in principle, would, would do that. Um, but the Japanese government has slightly dragged its feet over this facility for quite a number of years. Um, so it's not quite clear whether this one will be built yet. Um, so there are, at the moment, there are competing uh, designs for the next big particle collider, one of which is the compact linear collider. So that's, uh, will be, that's, that would be, if it's built, it would be based at CERN. Um, slightly different design. The technology for that is not quite as mature as the, as the ILC, the International Linear Collider. But this will consist of an 11 kilometer tunnel um, using, with a beam energy of around 380 GeV. That's, that's mostly to study the Higgs boson, which is 125 GeV. Um, and this would be mostly built by um, CERN member states, and again, to study the Higgs boson in detail. But then there's another, <laughs> I haven't finished yet, there's another, um, another idea, which is a future circular collider. Um, so this is another facility that would do pretty much initially the same as the ILC and CLIC in studying the Higgs boson in, in, um, in much greater detail. This involves quite a, a big 100 kilometer long tunnel. Um, first stage would use 240 GeV, um, electron positrons, but then the, the possible advantage of this one is that it could be then uh, trans, kind of transformed in some sense uh, to a proton-proton collider uh, much later on, which would then reach energies of around 100 TeV compared to what the LHC currently operates at, which is around 13 TeV. Um, so that would be kind of looking for new particles, supersymmetric particles, for example. But the cost of that, so the cost of the, it's not $9, by the way, that's $9 billion. Um, that will be for the, the, first, the first aspect of it, so the electron-positron machine, and then potentially around 25 billion for the proton-proton collider. So that's kind of two that are based at CERN. Um, then there is another one. Um, the, the, this, is based in, this will be based in China, if it did go ahead. This is a circular electron-positron collider, and the design of which is very similar to the, uh, to the CERN machine. So I'm not going to say too much about that. Um, it potentially would be, it would be somewhat cheaper than, than the CERN machine, but, it's, but, the, but the design of which um, we're not too clear about at the moment. So they're kind of four facilities um, that could be then uh, in future uh, as a successor to the Large Hadron Collider. So which one, which one will be built? Well, at the moment, there's, a, there's a, um, <clears throat> a certain strategy going on. So that will be released in May where um, that would be the European uh, particle physics strategy. Um, I don't think they're actually going to decide on which one um, could, go, could be the top priority. Um, I think if, if, if the Japanese government did get behind the ILC, that probably would have been the, the option then for them to go with that one. But <coughs> given how much Japan is dragging its feet, it's unclear whether, whether, um, whether they will <clears throat> put all their eggs in that basket. I think what is clear is that the community seems to say, seems to think that a electron positron machine should be the next um, big physics experiment after the, after the uh, Large Hadron Collider. So some other um, facilities then, um, so not in particle physics, uh, 
one of which is being built, or actually, most of it is actually already complete, the Extreme Laser Infrastructure, ELI for short. Um, and this is a, a laser facility that uses very high-powered, ultra-short laser beams. Um, and this investigates a number of different aspects, such as um, nuclear physics and also um, in terms of particle-driven acceleration through lasers. Um, there's three facilities uh, that are based around uh, one in Czech Republic, one in Hungary and one in Romania. Um, but the interesting thing is there's the fourth one that's being planned, which would be a very ultra-high power <laughs> facility. Um, so that would be around, uh, I think, an order of magnitude more than the 10 pet petawatts um, that's, that the other ELI facilities have. And then there's the... Um, I'm nearly coming to my top ten, the, the, the end of the top ten. Um, the European Exploration Cells, that's, that's uh, been built in Lund, in Sweden. So this is a big ne neutron uh, facility. And basically what neutron facilities are, they're kind of like a, a giant microscope in that you can kind of look straight through, straight into sa samples. So as I said before, these are kind of, tend to be kind of complementary techniques. So, you know, the scientists will do some research at their lab and then they'll take their sample and, that, and then... Um, and then study it in, in a neutron beam so you can get things like you know, sample structures, magnetic structures, things like that. Um, that's been mostly built by Sweden um, for a cost of 1.8 billion, but should come online in the next few years, 2023. Then the recently, this one got the go-ahead recently, this is the Electron Ion Collider that's based at uh, Brookhaven, will be based at Brookhaven National Laboratory. So Brook, Brookhaven currently operates the RIC Collider, which is at the top there. Um, that basically accelerates protons and heavy nuclei and then smashes them together to study things, aspects like the quark gluon plasma. Um, so, so RIC currently is a 3.8 kilometer particle accelerator. Um, and the electron ion collider will basically kind of go into that existing ring. Um, and that should, that should come online around 20, 2030 of cost of around $2 billion. Uh, and then finally, it's ETA. I'm not going to say too much about that. Um, that's already been talked about quite a bit today. Um, the, first, the first plasma of that should be 2025, and then 10 years later, the first um, deuterium tritium plasma. So there are my kind of like 10, 10 facilities that are kind of coming up in the next decade. But I'll just end on a few slides towards the end, um, one of which is kind of looking at you know, what, are the big, what are some of the benefits of, of big science infrastructure. You know, as I mentioned in the, some of the previous slides, it's, you know, real, it is science that, in some sense, senses captures the public imagination. You know, the pi first picture of a black hole that was on every newspaper around the world. And there's a lot of kind of a human element to that in terms of training, human capital, but also collaboration. You know, a lot of countries come together to work together uh, to build these facilities. And then there are other things like spin-offs, um, you know, as Carol mentioned, things like Wi-Fi, for example. Example, you know, the World Wide Web that was discovered at CERN or uh, produced at CERN. And then there's also CERN is also uh, some of the technologies that's happened at CERN have gone into kind of med things like medical imaging as well. But it also kind of drives companies as well to, in to innovate. You know, a lot of companies are, are involved with building certain aspects of, of big science. And that encu encourages them as well to push the boundaries, boundaries in at the same time. And actually, there's this interesting book if for anyone interested. Um, kind of looking at some of the benefits of big science. Um, and this is the econ economist who carried out a cost-benefit analysis. You know, if you take into account all these benefits uh, from big science, you know, um, is it really beneficial to do... You know, is it really, does it work in terms of a cost-benefit analysis? And he actually showed that it, that it does. You know, the benefits, all these benefits uh, really do outweigh, the, you know, the, some, in some sense, the immense cons cost of building uh, big science. You know, but there are, there are some, you know, it's, it's worthwhile to point out at the same time that there are some issues as well um, that do come up when, you know, some of these facilities are being built. Um, <clears throat> one example is the, one recent example is a 30-metre telescope that's similar to the European Extremely Large Telescope I mentioned before. Um, that's being built in Hawaii, but it's come up against considerable resistance um, from um, native Hawaiians, you know, who, who don't want because these, these uh, telescopes are being built in some sense on sacred land there. You know, they don't want scientists coming along and building ever bigger and bigger telescopes. 
Uh, so there's been quite a lot of delay with the, with the 30 meter telescope recently um, in terms of getting an agreement with um, you know, the people who live there, native Hawaiians, about um, you know, how they can kind of move forward. And that's resulted in some of the telescopes that are existing uh, being decommissioned. Um, but at the moment, there is still, uh, there's still protests going on in terms of uh, you know, stopping, uh, stopping construction from going ahead. And as Carol mentioned there as well, um, FAST was another, another example of, uh, there were some reports about you know, the, the government moving uh, people away from, or relocating people um, from nearby the telescope so there wouldn't be too much radio interference. You know, so, there are, so there are impacts that some of these facilities do have on, um, on society. Um, then there also costs, you know, some of the, the costs involved, you know, kind of go up and up and up, you know, the 100 kilometer collider potential at CERN, that would, that would cost, you know, around 25 billion, you know, you have to weigh up whether, whether that would be, that would actually be, be worth that huge investment. And then there's also the case of whether some of these things are too big to fail, you know, for the example, the James Webb Space Telescope, and um, that's gone through Congress many times um, in terms of budget overruns, um, delays, um, you know, it's been threatened quite a number of times in terms of just being cancelled. And actually in the, in the US budget that Trump announced um, in January, um, the success of the James Webb Space Telescope would be a, a mission called W First. Um, and, he's been, and the Trump administration is basically trying to zero out um, all funding for that at the moment. <laughs> Whether that actually will get through Congress probably, is probably another question. Um, a slight footnote as well on the um, kind of interesting aspect, the, the, the rise of China in the past decade or so. Um, I've been to China a few times, but three times um, to kind of look at some, around some of their facilities. Um, and they've gone through an incredible pace of construction in terms of synchrotrons. I think they have about three or four synchrotrons now, neutron facility, and also space launches as well. Um, but it'd be interesting to see what happens there in the coming decade, you know, the, whether they kind of go from, in some sense, like a follower um, mentality to more like becoming a leader. In, you know, they have plans to build an electron ion collider similar to the one I mentioned um, at Brookhaven. Um, whether they will go ahead with the China electron positron collider, um, that would be a real, um, you know, big boost part particles if they did. And then also they have plans for an underground. Um, gravitational wave, wave detector, which would be a bit more sensitive to lower frequency gravitational waves than, say, LIGO, for example. So, so some kind of interesting things. It'll be, be interesting to see what happens in the next, um, the next decade there. I mean, there are some you know, the positive and negatives about China, you know, positives in terms of funding. Um, there seems to be a political will as well to get you know, science on the agenda there. But then there are some kind of negatives in terms of, in terms of attracting people to the country to work there, especially foreigners, um, and then also around collaboration. Right, so I'll end it on <coughs> final slide. <coughs> you can take this with a pinch of salt. Um, but a few, predi few predictions that might happen in the coming decades. Um, it kind of looks like the International Linear Collider will get the go-ahead. Um, as I mentioned before, J Japan was dragging its feet quite a lot with that, but I think it probably will it will finally come round to, to, um, to giving it the green light in, in the coming, possibly in the coming year. Uh -huh. um, launch of the James Webb Space Telescope as well, that was some spectacular images, probably should be, uh, should be coming from that instrument. Uh, first plasma ETA 2025, and then maybe towards the end of the 2020s, we might get some indication around uh, a CP violation, possibly neutrinos with the hyper Kamiya candidate and um, the long baseline neutron facility, neutrino facility in the US. And then of course, maybe, <laughs> maybe we'll get the manned return, returns to uh, the moon as well, both US and China. So I'll end with that one. Thank you for this <laughs> Thanks, Michael, for a great talk. Yeah, I, I'm not convinced by this too big to fail, having lived through the cancellation of the SSC a friend of mine, Jim Brown, made an appointment to see his congressman shortly before and went into his office to try to explain the physics important. You should never cancel this project. 
And the guy's first comment to him was that uh, if you mention the word Higgs boson, I will get my strong man to physically throw you out of my office. He'd heard these arguments so many times. <laughs> so it didn't work in that case. Anyway, questions for Mike? Yeah, I actually want to come to this too big, uh, too fail. <laughs> if that is the case, that really explains why uh, too big, too fail. Because if we don't have, if you like, uh, a foresight, we will not be able to measure uh, the goals of this uh, uh, big <coughs> projects in the next 10 years or so. So uh, there is too much room to claim success in them. I wonder what's... Mm. I mean, there are, uh, for example, in Europe, there, are, there is the um, S3 roadmaps. There are certain roadmaps out there. That do, you know, they contain um, you know twenty or thirty facilities that are that are beyond you know the next decade. You know they're being planned for the next twenty or thirty years. You know so that planning does exist. I mean I was just mentioning in this talk about the next ten year period. I mean these are facilities that are already being built to some extent now. Um, but you know so, you know physicists come together and they and they roadmap it out for you know twenty or thirty years ahead of time. Um, it's not just about the next decade. Can I come to that? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, basically, in foresight, we have four scenarios. Uh, it's a long time I haven't seen. Uh, uh, governance against uh, something else I can't remember. Uh, 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 local governance, uh, national governance, uh, uh, corporate, uh, co cooperation government. Uh, uh, and from that, we see how, for instance, climate change will be evolving. Uh, uh, if we don't have a systematic approach, to a foresight for science, uh, identifying what are the future possibilities, uh, it will be very loose. Mm. It will be more of si science fiction than foresight for science. Yeah. Don't you think? Hi, can, uh, can I just ask, there were a few things I was quite surprised not to, to see there, but perhaps, okay, yeah, yeah, you, that, perhaps it was yeah. deliberately just focused on Physics. Yeah. Um, so maybe something on exoplanets and the search for life. Um, something on so, something more to do with solving climate problems and beyond what we've already looked at with with plasma and so on. And also um, biological hacks and you know the risk around CRISPR technology and things like that. Right. So uh, it's really a question: Was it deliberately <coughs> focused just around physics, mm. or, or it is just? Yes, it was. Yeah, I mean, CRISPR, for example. I, yeah, I, um, I didn't want to go into any of anything. No, I mean, um, okay. but it was mostly, yeah, primed on physics um, in terms of astronomy, nuclear physics. Um, in terms of exoplanets, I mean, yeah, a lot of you know the ELT, a lot of ground-based telescopes will be um, kind of you know trying to study the atmospheres of exoplanets. A lot of those kind of missions, yes. and they're kind of small. There are a lot of smaller. Um, space-based missions that are launching. I mean, there's quite a few already that are already planned in the next few years in terms of exoplanets. Yeah. Um, but what I was kind of covering here was kind of some of the much bigger scales, you know, billion dollar um, facilities. You know, there are many that are kind of, you know, 500 million, for example, um, that would, yeah, that are, that are planning to study exoplanets. Mm. Great. Yeah, okay. I mean, the, the, the title of this meeting was The Rise of Big Science in yes. Physics, so <laughs> yes. fair enough. But, <laughs> okay, sorry, there's a question. Um, hi, yes, yeah, so um, my question is around, um, s since you're doing this sort of synthesis of how the history of the um, um, big science maps and transforms into the future, I'm interested in whether you could comment on the relation, changing and evolving relationship between the science, big science and society in terms of political structure and governance and, 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 and this idea. So, so picking up on what the gentleman over there said about foresight, um, it seems to me that, that there have been some spectacular failures in, in, in that even roadmap. Just looking at NASA and the fact that they didn't seem to have uh, the next step ready after they, they, they finished the shuttle, space shuttle missions, there was nothing there uh, 
to, 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 to sort of, you know, very embarrassing, I think, I think, I think situation. Um, so, so how is that evolving? How is the coming of private finance, you know, the rise of tech billionaires and, and, and their interest, uh, you know, in, in sort of sci science, especially space science, and willingness to throw huge sums of money, willingness and ability, actually, how is it changing? And also mentioning uh, uh, about China and, and you know, their will to, to drive the development of big science, that will um, is presumably to some extent driven by political agendas that may be quite retrograde to, to you know, um, scientific collaboration um, because they may have their, 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 their sort of um, political agenda um, behind it. So could you make some comment about um, and, and how does imp uh, how does that sort of you know risks the risks to, to big science? How, how does that sort of um, impact? So, but. Um, when, I mean, in terms of China, yeah, they're, they're obviously pushing. They have obviously a political will there to to um, you know kind of foster a lot of science innovation in terms of you know building all this kind of basic science infrastructure in the last ten years. Um, you know, they build they can build facilities so quick. Uh, you know, it takes a few years to build. So, there's obviously a um, you know, big political will there to, to kind of foster that, um, that science. I mean, in terms of, um, in terms of private, so private, um, well, in terms of like space, private, finance. private finance. finance projects, especially space Yeah, I mean, you've got like you've got certain companies um, are, are obviously involved with, um, you know, SpaceX, for example. Is that what you're talking about? SpaceX. 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 Yeah, um, you know, they've obviously launched, launched quite a lot of Constellation kind of missions in the past year, um, a lot of which are actually affecting astronomy observations at the moment. Um, but it's hard to gauge yeah, what kind of societal impacts that might have. Um, yeah, I, I, to be honest, I don't really... How does that transform that relationship between... Because the model of, of the big science so far has been this, this sort of government uh, institutions, yeah. big inter-government collaborations, and, and now it, it, it may well be transforming how, in your view, is that risky? Is that beneficial? What's your view on that? Um, whether it's risky or beneficial? Um, yeah, I'm not really too, too sure to me whether it, whether it takes some of the... I mean, obviously, there's, a, there's an issue, you know, with government, a lot of government from facilities, you know, that a lot of them, a lot of them have delays, etc. Um, cost hikes, there's obviously some issues there in management structures. Um, whether that would then not happen in private endeavour, Maybe it would be more streamlined in some sense. I don't know. I mean, yeah, there might be benefits there in terms of um, potential completion time. And on the issue of foresight, I mean, I think it so much comes down to, to particular individuals. I mean, gravity waves have been searched for since the very early 60s, and there have been false indications and so on and so forth. And I remember, you know, probably five years ago, talking to Barish had something to do with Linear Collider, and he was, you know, LIGO was just seeing nothing, okay, and he was so confident that the next step advanced LIGO would see gravitational waves, and thank goodness the NSF stuck with them, because there were people who were saying, you know, they've had enough, it's just not going to happen, and then they got this amazing signal immediately, it was just fantastic, so it's, uh, foresight is often uh, quite localised, and fortunately, in their case, the funding agency backed them, and it hasn't always happened. There was a question across there. Um, yeah, so you, um, sorry, so actually, actually what you just said sort of does something that's bugged me for a while is, is that of course, learn to, to, from the comment that uh, Professor Daniel just made, that of course the breakthrough prize is given to the collaborations it's not given to the bureaucrat who stuck up for the project for goodness knows how many years. And they're really the person who actually took a risk in, in, in sticking with it. Um, anyway, so that, that's, uh, that's just me ranting. Um, <laughs> you, so you, you had a point that said that you know, big science facilities are getting more and more expensive. And, mm. you know, is, that, is there also a separate issue that, that, that keeping the data from these things is getting more and more expensive and who's doing it and of course it has to be carried on being kept after the, the funding for the thing itself is finished. 
Yeah, there are a lot of um, initiatives in terms of, well, you mean in terms of open data, in terms of publishing, <coughs> publishing Yeah, well, when you're talking about the, the, the scale of the data that comes out of the SKA, you can't just put it on tapes and keep it in a cardboard box in the corner of the office anymore. So, how do you preserve it, and is, is that cumulative cost going to cause problems? Um, I can't quite comment on how, how much that would cost to preserve it. I don't, I don't quite know how the, uh, the cost that involves um, with, with doing something like that. But of course, you know, these, these kind of facilities do produce huge amounts of data. Um, you know, Sky is one example, um, but also kind of the, the Event Horizon Telescope that also produced um, you know, terabytes of data that had to be then you know, managed in terms of... Um, I think actually some of the data sets were actually flown by plane in terms of physically actually flown to a data centre that then um, you know, carried out some kind of uh, processing of that data that then that was then analysed by scientists. Um, so yeah, I mean, that is a chat. I can't ca quite comment on you know, the costs involved with that, but it is an issue of, you know, in terms of the huge amounts of, of data that's produced. Um, I think the LHC, I mean, I, someone might correct me on this, but the LHC actually doesn't use quite a lot of the data that it actually produces. You know, it kind of like bins quite a bit of data. Um, but someone might know better than me about that. <laughs> so thanks again very much. <laughs>